Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work at Advanced Technology Support in Europe for IBM. This is a video in a series, AIX in Focus, and today's subject is LVM, or Logical Volume Manager. This series is aimed at systems administrators, so you know something about Unix, AIX, or Linux, and we're not going to cover the basic user-level commands like we see on this chart. LVM came seventh in the AIX Best Bits vote. I hope you've already worked out that LVM means Logical Volume Manager. A PV is a physical volume. In old terms, this is our brown spinning disks. In more modern systems, then we have things like solid state drives and NVMEs and LUNs across a SAN. But they all are regarded as physical volumes with different properties. And when you see them in AIX, they're called a H disk and then a number to identify each of your physical volumes. These are put into volume groups, so there's groups of disks. Then we have a lot of space inside a volume group, much bigger than a single disk. It could be hundreds of disks in there. And we pull out a section of that disk space and call it a logical volume. And if you like, that's the disk space in which you do things, like putting a file system. The physical partition, the name's rather odd and doesn't really apply anymore, but this is the smallest piece of disk that you can actually allocate. We don't want to deal with 512 byte sectors on disks and things like that. It doesn't even apply with our modern technology. But if you think of the standard disk perhaps in your volume group is a terabyte, then the size of the PP will be about one thousandth of that, it will be a gigabyte. That will be the smallest unit that you can allocate. And nobody wants to allocate anything smaller than a gigabyte these days. You don't want a file system less than a gigabyte. So let's go through that again in words. We have the grouping the disks of physical volumes into volume groups. A volume group contains thousands of PPs. These are the small chunks that we allocate. The PPs are allocated to a logical volume for many purposes. We have boot disks, file systems, paging, and raw access disks, perhaps for your relational databases that don't want a file system in the way. There's lots of allocation policies for your logical volumes, your LVs, although most of those apply to brown spinning disks. There were lots of techniques to get the best performance out of your spinning disks. A lot of those don't apply with solid state drives. Also in AX, we have logical volume level mirroring. We don't mirror disks such, we don't mirror volume groups. Each individual logical volume can have a mirror. You can actually have one mirror or two, so that's one copy, two copies, or three copies. Ironically, we do have a mirror VG command, but that just means mirror all the logical volumes inside a particular volume group. If you go back a couple of decades, we ran everything on one disk, and laptops are still doing this for some strange reason. But anyway, then we could, with very low-level primitive partitioning of your disk, the little table at the front, then we'd split up the disk into various parts, and that means that if the one part of it gets corrupted, we don't have to drag in from backups the whole lot, and we probably, if we're lucky, can get the operating system up to actually do that from there. But what happens if we want bigger databases that are more performance? Well, the best way to do is add some more disks, have more spindle heads and arms flying about, and we can get higher data rates off more disks. So we can split the database out, actually gain some performance by splitting our logs away from our data, for example. But then we want bigger disks and more performance, so we get a whole bunch of disks in here, and lots of things can be used to spread the data out. Here we're having different file systems that will be used for the different parts of the database, for example. But if you carry this on to its logical extension, then if you want bigger bigger databases and more performance, you end up with hundreds of disks and hundreds of file systems. And then you work out that some of these disks are red hot because they get more data on others. And then your database administrators spent all their life moving data between disks to try and even it all out. And you suddenly realize there must be a better way. Let's start again with our big picture, but taking it from a logical volume manager point of view. We consider each disk or physical volume we could regard it as a collection of disk PPs, these physical partitions or chunks of disk space. These are typically in the order of 256 megabytes to a couple of gigabytes, depending on how big your disk drives are. And we don't want to deal with piffling small change like half case sectors on the disk. These days, disks are fairly cheap. I've rarely allocated anything smaller than a gigabyte. Why would you bother? Just give them a gigabyte. It's not actually worth very much. If we group our disks together into a group, it's called a volume group. But there's a collection of these physical volumes and each of those disks have uh, made up the same size PP so that they're consistent across the disks. Regardless of the type of disk they are and the size of the disk they are. Now it's fairly common practice to have all the disks the same size in a volume group but you may have bought a computer on one year with you know, disks of one size and two years later you bought some extra disks and you may have bought some 
different discs because the price point was better. So you could have variations of size, but it's typically one or two sizes of discs in a volume group. You could also look at it as a volume group rather being aware of the discs inside it. It's just one great big pool of PPs. When we want to allocate a logical volume, we just say how many PPs we want, and that's the size of the logical volume. Sometimes, however, we do actually care about the disc because we can optimize the disc performance a little bit. So let's go back to my simple diagram. I made all the discs the same because that is pretty normal. Now, if you want to allocate some space for a particular purpose, perhaps just to put some temporary files, we're going to throw them away later on. So we could create a logical volume on one disk does take up and what is that 10 pps to make it up the file system perhaps it's something bigger and we actually want to have more than one disk involved note the pps don't have to be the same on every disk it could be a bit on several of the disks maybe depending on what's available at the time and they don't have to be on the same part of the disk it's just allocating a pp from a disk wherever it's available we can also create one across all the disks now this is fairly normal because then we get all the disks are available to do io so that gets our performance up uh, a bit higher and again because it doesn't have to be the same part of the disk in each case of the disk it would just allocate in the same number of pps and our logical volume would be naturally spread across the disks now to make life easier we're going to take this picture out and uh, show it like this and then we're going to actually look at the way we can actually lay out these partitions in red there we're going to allocate uh, 0 to 399 that's 400 pps physical partitions and they're going to be numbered over here 0 to 99 100 to 199 that means when we start allocating space or putting files into the file system if that's what's in the logical volume then we're going to fill up all these pps across in here on the first disk and when that's full up then we'll start allocating some space from the second disk and the third and the fourth that does mean if we only ever create 80 pps worth of data it'll all be on one disk that so that's not very good for performance. Another way of allocating it is to spread out the PP. So this is PP0, here's PP1, here's PP2, here's PP3, and then we go around to have 4, 5, 6, and 7, etc. This means once we filled up the first PP, maybe it's a gigabyte in size, the second gigabyte of data would now be on the second disk, the third and fourth. Now we've got all the spindles involved with keeping the data I.O. rates up nice and high. And we tend to call this PP level striping, or at least I do, I think that's common practice. There's another form of striping, what I call fine striping where we go out down to a much more detailed level of striping. So we've got all these various sizes of striping here all the way down to the 4K block. That's very, very fine striping. But that means for each block in here, the first block has a whole bunch of records. I, I don't know what the size is, sort of, maybe the 32K records. So this is the first 32K will be written here into that first block. So the next 32K will be written here in this block, and then 32K and 32K. And then it comes around on the next block of this PP is actually used for the next record around it goes. So this was very popular in old days with brown spinning discs where we wanted to fine stripe the data all across the discs. Now we don't go down to 4K. We tend to start at like 64K because that tends to be about the, uh, the lowest size of a database record these sort of days. We wouldn't want to go if the database records were 64 down to 4k because to do that you'll have to get a little piece of data from here a little piece of data from here a little piece of data from here, a little piece of data put it all together into a block to hand it to your database which would be an awful lot more effort normally the striping is a number of your physical records in your database and that stops it having to reuse every disk to get one block of data back to your database these days we don't tend to do this sort of fine striping particularly for solid state drives nvme and if you've got a back end luns over a sound because you can't actually tell how things are laid out in the back end and in solid state drives every single block is equally available at the same amount of effort there's no head movements and seek times in there to worry about we can also do mirroring with lvm at the lv logical volume level all that means is we allocate two pps for each pp of the logical volume then when we want to update it we have to update both copies and so they're kept in sync there's actually two mechanisms that we can update one make sure that's okay and then update the other one or we can actually do that in parallel for a little bit extra performance the pp copies don't need to be on the same part of the disk or the, it can be anywhere on a different disk the key note is that the logical volume manager will make sure the two copies are not on the same physical disk, otherwise there's no point in having a mirror. 
In fact, they could be scattered all over the other disks. We don't really care where they are as long as they're on a different disk. We can also break off a mirror so we could stop updating one of the copies. Then we can mount that as a file system perhaps and back it up to tape. It's a consistent point in time copy of the perhaps database files, for example. Then we can re-mirror the copy, it's called sync VG, and get them back out of date so we have back out of the mirrors for protection. Now you might say, ah, hang about, while we've broken this mirror, we've only got one copy, so we're not protected. Well, they thought of that, we can have three copies. So we break one off and we still have mirror protection for our important data. So a quick reminder of what we've seen so far. The LVM allows us many advanced features for our logical volumes. We can span disks, we can mirror for redundancy, we can stripe uh, for performance. We can, if we've allocated a PP from a particular disk, we can ask that PP to be moved to a different disk. That might be the case where you want, you want to pull a disk out of a volume group, for example, or perhaps it's causing some errors in the log and it's getting flaky and we want to move the data onto a different disk so we can actually remove the faulty disk. There's another feature I haven't really covered is that for a whole volume group, if we unmount any file systems or the use of the, the logical volumes in the volume group, then we can vary off. That sort of hibernates the volume group so IO can't go to it and then we can use export VG command and disown it from this copy of AIX. Now if we have the technology so that we can actually move that set of disks, they're actually aware of each other, to another copy of AIX. We, in the old days we had special SCSI cables to do that, now we have uh, fiber channel SANS so we can make the disks available on a different copy of AIX. Or we could be using the virtual IO server to move the virtual disk to another virtual machine in the same power server. Then we can do an import of the volume group. We just have to name one of the disks. It has on every disk what the other disks are required to, for the volume group. If it finds the set, then we can import the volume group. We can find all the logical volumes on the other copy of AIA. One little note, again, something we haven't covered in detail. Typically, our logical volumes having a journal file systems in there for the bulk of our data, but they're also used for other things. There's the boot block is a logical volume. We have things like the JFS2 logs in there, system dumps. So we have a crash. We can dump the copy of memory in there for later analysis. We have raw devices and the paging spaces that are actually in a logical volume as well. A couple of uh, logical volume manager conventions in here. The physical volumes, the disks, are all called H disks once they are got to AX, regardless of the actual type and media. There are some peculiar exceptions to that, but uh, if you're sticking with IBM disks, that's the rule. Many system admin people, when they create a volume group, they give it a name, but always end it with VG at the end. And if you're creating a logical volume, they tend to put LV at the end. That just makes it very clear what you're actually looking at, and you can remember the different set of commands for the two sorts of resource. When you install AIX, part of that install process is creating the first volume group, and so that's always called root VG. Oddly, the logical volumes in that are called HD1 to HD11. Nobody I know knows why. It's lost in the mists of time. That was the first person that got AIX decided to call on this. We always recommend that you keep your root VG nice and small, maybe one or two disks for your mirror. That means the backup is fast, it's separated from your data. It means if you destroy your root VG, you can rebuild it without losing any data, for example. And you tend to use a command called makes this big. There's another video for that. I like to think of LVM as a three dimension box around all the functionality. So from the volume groups, we can work out the physical volumes in the volume group and we can see the logical volumes in it. Or we could come in from the physical volumes and work out which volume group that is in and which bits of the logical volume are on this physical disk. And the same with logical volumes, we can work out which volume group we're in and we can find out how it's spread across the physical volumes. So in the next section, we're looking at these three views and how we can work out the other ones and we'll be using the ls commands for each so we can see the details of these resources and these are the things that you can actually change with the commands and the layouts and setup. So looking at the volume groups, if we just type in LSVG, we get a list of the volume group names on your system. If we name a volume group, then we get all the details of the volume group, how it's set up, its resources, it occupies, and all that sort of thing. If we use the minus L option, then we get the LV view of what's in the volume group. And if we put a P in here, we get the PV view 
view of what's in the volume group so let's have a look at some examples of those commands up at the top here we see lsvg and we just get the names of the volume groups we can use these names then in the lsvg with the volume group name and we get some more information about this specific volume group apart from things like the great big giant uh, hexadecimal identifier this is probably the most important thing to check first this is the physical partition size this is the smallest allocation unit of size in the volume group when we're creating logical volumes so we can see this 256 megabytes in size quarter of a gigabyte the size of the volume group is 511 pps and it does that note out here so you don't have to keep doing the math to work out what that means so that's 130,000 megabytes uh, that's actually 128 gigabytes we can also see how much is free if we want to create new logical volumes there's lots of other stats in here that we're not going to cover in a great deal of detail the nice to see up in here this is the number of logical volumes 13 and this is the number that's actually online it's actually open here's the command with the minus l option we can see in here that this one is closed so it was the boot logical volume that's not actually currently open no point in it being open while the operating system's running we can see the various uses of logical volumes in here we have paging log dump and all the others are jfs2 and we can see their mount points over here the others are accessed directly by the kernel and not mounted as file systems down in here we have the minus p option and this volume group is contained on just one disk this happens to be a shared storage pool so we actually mirrored this at the virtual io server level so we don't see mirrors in this particular case and we actually have raid disks at the back on two different disk subsystems there v7000s again we can see the size uh, of the total pps and how many is free is quite useful but if we had multiple disks in here then we'd have how many pps are free on each of those disks and this is used as a sort of little map in here this is saying that the free space is all actually up at one end let's turn to the physical volume view if we just use the lspv we get a list of the disks and the volume groups to which they're assigned if they're not in a volume group then we can see that as well if we use lspv with the name of a particular physical volume then we get the details of of the volume if you use the minus l option then we see a list of the logical volumes that are on this physical volume don't forget logical volumes can spread across physical volumes the disks so we'll see the bit of the logic volume that's actually on this disk and if you use the minus p option then it's going to list these pps the physical partitions the chunks of disk and how they're laid out on this physical volume this disk so let's have a look at some of the output of these commands now here's the first one the lspv and we can see the list of uh, disks in here and the volume groups to which they're attached if we name a particular disk this is the last one is scratch vg then we can find some identifiers which volume group it's in and some basic sizes now we're in an odd situation here this machine is using shared storage pools so in this case we have a single disk which is the whole of a volume group if we look back to older brand spinning disks typically you'd have maybe a dozen disks in a volume group so the sizes in here are actually the same as the sizes of the entire volume group so we've seen some of these numbers before if we look at the other commands the the l in here we can see a list of the logical volumes or part of these logical volumes that are actually sitting on this particular disk we can see we have two things in here temp and scratch our journal file system sitting in here test is something i was playing with when i was creating this video if you use the p option then we're going to get these physical partitions so these are the from one to 512 that's the number of physical partitions on this disk we can see if they're in use or not these names in here and we've seen them in here as well if we don't name a particular logical volume when we create it then these are the names that are generated we can see the jfs2 and there's the log and uh, where, it's, where they're actually mounted now these regions in here if we were a brown spinning disk this would make a lot more sense so we have the outer edge the center of the disk and then the inner middle and edges of the disk and we were very careful in placing logical volumes on particular parts of physical volumes for better performance if you think of it the, of the sectors on a round spinning disk then on the outer edge it's much larger than the inner edge of a disk and so there's more sectors going past the head every second so you actually get better read and write performance if the 
hot data is out on this outer edge. We don't do this anymore if we're talking about LUNs or solid state drives, because these make no sense. With logical volumes, we don't have a command to just list the logical volumes, but if we run this little script in here, we can. This uses the LSVG to give us the name of all the volume groups, and we go around the volume groups using the LSVG minus L to list out all the logical volumes. We use LSLV and the name of the logical volume if you want all the details of it. We use the minus L option. This is where it gets a little bit odd. This lists the physical volumes of the logical volume. So where it is placed on the disks inside the volume group. The minus P option gives us the PPs, the physical partitions of this logical volume. And the minus M option allows us to see the mirroring, to see each PP and where that is mirrored onto a particular disk. So let's have a look at these commands now. So this isn't an LV command, this is the VG command of the L, and we can see the logical volumes down in here. We're actually going to take this one here, which is our slash opt. It's pretty small, um, but the name of the logical volume is HD10 opt. Note this is on a different copy of AIX, it's the root VG, so these things will look different to what we saw uh, previously. I took this example because we have an example of mirroring in here. So here we have the, the logical partitions is one, but the physical partitions is three. This is because we have a three-way mirror for this particular file system containing slash opt. We'll see that again on the next couple of charts. If we ask the details of HD10 opt. Here we see there are three copies. And again, this is the sort of logical size. It's one size, but there are three copies because of the mirrors. Down in here, we have the minus L option. So this is giving us the disks where this is sitting on. So some of this logical volume are on these three different disks. Now, because we've only got one block, there's just one block on each of these three disks in this case. If we look at the minus M option with the name of the logical volume, we can see this is the first LP1, then this is the physical partition, so on disk 0, it's the 226th PP, and on the H disk 1, it's in a slightly different place, and H disk 2, it's in the same place as this disk. If we use this command, then we're going to take a disk, and we can see the physical partitions where they're actually used and free. So we could determine where on a brown spinning disk there is free space, so we know which ones will be the fast or slow ones. We don't tend to use this uh, anymore. So we looked at the three resources of the logical volume manager and the attributes of each by using the ls command. Now, in AIX terms, we have mk commands, which make the resource. We have ls commands that list the resource details. And we have ch, which gives us the ability to change the settings. And then we have rm to remove them, a sort of full life cycle. So for our LVM, we have a whole bunch of commands with mk, ls, change and remove, but there are a few more and I'll introduce those now. So in the volume group we have make, list and change. We also have commands in here called extend. This gives us the ability to add a disk, a physical volume, to a logical volume and we can reduce VG, take a disk out. Well, presumably we haven't got any data on it left anymore, so we can actually pull the disk out of the volume group. And if you take the last disk out of a volume group, then the volume group disappears, so we don't have remove volume group, we just empty it, and then all the disks are on the free list. There's another one in here with import and export. This allows us to take a volume group, a set of disks, and export it so that this copy of AIX sort of disowns it. Now, if we have the technology so that those disks can be moved to a different copy of AIX on the same machine or a different machine, then then we could import that volume group. We name one of the disks, and that disk knows about all the other disks it needs to import at the same time to get the entire volume group brought back into that new copy of AIX. And there's another terms in here with very on and very off. I, I think we inherited these from mainframe guys. I've never seen the term before. But if you vary off a volume group, it sort of freezes it. So we still know about it, but it's not online. We can't access the disks. Very little we can uh, see or change. Then we have to vary it back 
back on if we actually want to do any changes to it or actually get the data or write to read or write data from the disk again. There's a few quirky ones down here. We have save VG and restore VG. That allows us to back up a volume group as one particular unit. A volume group may actually have like the entire database in it, so we can back up the entire database. We can either do that to another set of disks, or we could do it tape drives, for example. So we can take the entire volume group and save it, and we can bring back the entire volume group. We also have one called sync VG, which is a little bit of a misnomer, actually. Um, it's actually going to synchronize the copies of logical volumes in a volume group. By default it will do all of them in the volume group but you can select to do particular ones if you really want to. On the logical volume side of things we have make list change and remove. We have a couple of extra commands in here we can make a logical volume copy so that if we've only got one copy then we could mirror it and get the first copy and then we could mirror it again to get the second copy. The copy LV command actually just makes a copy, a, a clone of the logical volume. If you want to save a logical volume um, somewhere else make a copy of it. We have extend logical volume so this lets you grow the size of a logical volume. All that's doing under the covers is adding those physical partitions. So if you've got 200 at the moment, you can grow it by another number of physical partitions and make the logical volume bigger. That extra space will effectively be on the back of the space in your logical volume. It just looks bigger because there's more blocks at the end. Making a point in here, there's no reduce LV. We'll come back to that in a minute. On the physical volume side, if you've added a disk to your computer, then you run the config manager command, cfgmgr, to find new disks. That's a standard systems administration uh, program you run. And then when you do LSPV, you'll find some new disks. We can remove a device of, of various flavors, including disks. And again, this is AIX will disown this drive so it is no longer part of this copy of AIX. We tend to use that if we've had a disk fail and AIX has told us that this, we can't do any I.O. to this, then we can eventually disown the disk and get rid of the disk before we actually pull it out and replace it with a new disk. So we don't have a make physical volume that's making something that's physical. We can't actually do that as a command, but we can list it, change it and uh, remove it. The last one here, Migrate PV, the name can be a little bit confusing. This is actually going to migrate the physical partitions. You know that, in our case, 256 megabyte chunks. Well, we can move a PP from one physical volume to another physical volume. And we can actually do that live, which is rather a clever operation, and while it's running while perhaps there's a file system inside it. This means we could move the PPs off a particular disk if we wanted to to remove a device from the computer because we want to take the disk out, for example, or we could migrate a PP to even out the I.O. across our set of disks. Perhaps we had four disks, we added four to it, and we could migrate some of the data from those hot, busy running disks to the other disks so that we're now operating and using I.O. from eight disks to get better performance. Now let's go back to this reduce LV command. If we had a command like that, it would be extremely extremely dangerous because your novice systems administrator might say oh we can extend it the logical volume to make it bigger and we can reduce it to make it smaller but if when you reduce it you're going to release some of those physical partitions from the end of the logical volume if there's any data in there it's immediately destroyed you're never going to get that back so people have a false sense of security that they're just reducing the size of a logical volume now those of you that have seen my JFS2 file system video then you know that one of our things that we're very proud of we can increase the size of a JFS2 file system which sits in a logical volume and we can reduce it so JFS2 software knows how to reduce a logical volume. But of course, it understands the layout of the journal file system and it knows how to move the data out of those blocks that it's about to release uh, and save that data in other PPs in the ones that it's not going to release so the journal file system data is safe. Now, there is an actual way of doing this operation. Uh, it's a rather complicated and you have to set up some maps, but that's not for the faint of heart. That's only to be used under the 
control of AOX support people telling you precisely the commands to run because the chances are that you can destroy your data. If you really need to reduce the size of a logical volume, you could create another logical volume, copy the data you want into it, and then throw away the older one. So there we have all the important commands for your logical volume manager. I don't think I've forgotten any, but I may have missed one or two. Um, I'm not going to go through all these commands and the 20 to 30 options that they all have because we'll be into an eight hour video and you'd all fall fast asleep. But I'm a visual thinker. I tend to rather than look at lists of things in this, I'd rather see how they're connected and how they uh, operate in here. So I've got this big diagram, this sort of state diagram of all the various commands you can actually run. I suggest you stop the movie if you want to have a look at all the details in this. I'll try and release this picture as part of the Air Expert blog. Okay, now let's talk to another subject, uh, LVM. Now, because there's lots of options to a lot of these commands, I don't actually sit there and read the manual pages and work out what's going on. I tend to use Smitty to do those sort of rarer operations. So how do you actually get there? If you hit Smitty, you'll get to the top page. You take System Storage, and you get down here, get Logical Volume Manager. There we go. If you click on this one, you get Volume Groups, Logical Volumes, Physical Volumes, and Paging Space. That's another one of the uses of a Logical Volume, of course. If that uh, takes too much effort going through the uh, the list in here if you type in LVM you get to that top level page if you smitty VG LV or PV you get to the page where those commands are handled and there's another one here for paging space why that's not paging I never know but it's paging space PGSP so we can very quickly get to the right part of smitty to find the commands we actually want to use if you want more information there's the knowledge center here's the place to go this is AX7 manual pages device management LVM. I'll put that link and the links that are coming up on the YouTube page for this video. We have an entire red book looking at troubleshooting and the commands, about a 50-50 split between those two. In this quite old now red book, it's even an old style front cover on it here. Still good though, particularly if you get to some really sticky situations with your logical volume manager and at that point you probably want to phone up AX support and ask for their advice before you make some ghastly mistake and trash your data. There's a more modern information available although this is from 2001 this is the AX system admin red book the go and see chapter six that's all about the logical volume manager and in the new AX enhancement modernization that came out in 2020 chapter seven is all about LVM very good reminder of the uh, fundamentals that are in AX and always have been I'm not covering this so you can't blame me so here are my golden rules for the AX LVM. Make your root volume group small and separate. I mean separate from your data. If you have a problem with your root VG and it's destroyed and you can't get the backup to work, well, you could rebuild your new fresh AX copy and import all your volume groups, get all your data back, and then you're well on the way of recovering your system. Get every disk to work for high performance. Don't separate your data because it looks nice on the chart. Get your data on every single disk so its I.O. is helping out performance for your system. Don't let a disk failure stop your system. Have them mirrored, have them raided, or have them protected by your back-end disk storage subsystem. Monitor your AX error logs. Quite often a disk will go flaky before it actually fails. Start having disk errors but it carries on and recovers from them. If you're aware of those you can get your data off the disks before they actually fail and don't meddle i find people asking me questions what happens if i change this little parameter and the answer is if you're not fixing a problem with your disks then don't fiddle about if you need help because you've got an lvm problem your data is at risk call the experts that's what AX support is there for, that's why you pay for them, and they really do know how to save your data. Also, read and practice on a test system. So, skill up so that in a crisis you're not panicking and making it worse. And no tipping, that's no testing in production. Just a little note in here that LVM came out with the original copy of AIX in about 1990. A big upgrade from the Unix is at the time AX is of course a Unix but IBM added the functionality to make it a proper operating system. 
It's been there a long time, very stable, very fast. I have an inkling that a lot of this concept is actually from the IBM mainframes at the time. Well, at the end of this video, it's been quite difficult to keep the content down below half an hour-ish, as there's so much good content in here. And after 35 years of using LVM, it's very easy to take for granted how powerful a subsystem it is, particularly things like that migrating the PVs live with the data being accessed. Please give the video a thumbs up and please subscribe, then you get told when the next video is uploaded.